It's Sunday morning, and thousands are about to begin their weekend ritual, the morning paper. 12-year-old Johnny Gosh delivers it. But this morning, the papers don't arrive, and Johnny won't return home. By daybreak, the Gosh family's phone begins to ring, customers inquiring about their papers. Dad goes looking and finds Johnny's wagon just blocks from home. Paper still stacked and untouched, but no sign of Johnny. In the weeks and months that followed, Johnny reportedly was seen at least twice identifying himself to strangers. But according to those same reports, a man quickly grabbed him away. A woman received in change in a store a dollar bill with the writing on the front of it, I am alive, signed in cursive writing, Johnny Gosh. That's just one more roadblock the family says it's encountered while searching for Johnny. We've sold candy bars, we've sold buttons. To trace Johnny, they've spent $75,000. We've had benefit dances, we've had garage sales, um, rummage sales, bake sales. Which they raise themselves. Anything that would be considered a fundraiser, we have done it. All we want is our boy back, and we're willing to do anything to get him back. Every day, 2,300 people go missing in America. They disappear, they vanish. Their families are left waiting and hoping, but never forgetting, and neither have we. 50 people, 50 days, 50 nights, we go live spotlighting America's missing. Girls and boys, mothers and fathers, and grandparents, they're gone. But where? Tonight, September 1982, a 12-year-old paper boy, Johnny Gosh, wakes up early to deliver Sunday morning papers. His route in Des Moines, Iowa, he never comes home. His wagon is found just two blocks from his home. It's still filled with the morning papers. Now, over two decades later, his mother firmly believes photos of her son, Johnny, mysteriously appear at her doorstep. Tonight, who took 12-year-old paper boy Johnny Gosh? I want to go straight out to Brad Ehrlich. He is a reporter for WHO Radio, joining us tonight from Des Moines, Iowa. Take us back to those early morning hours in September 5th, 1982. It was uh, pre-dawn that Sunday morning as Johnny Gosh woke up, as you usually did on Sunday mornings, to go pick up the paper just a couple blocks away where the Des Moines Register had a large drop-off for all the paper boys in the neighborhood to pick up their newspapers and deliver them. So a little bit before 6, 12-year-old Johnny, who, by the way, is taller than most people in his class and looks just a little bit older, goes out to go pick up his papers. Paper boys at the scene do see him there go and pick up the papers. But after that, things do get just a bit sketchy. What happens next is he continues to, uh, what happens is, is a blue car, what one witness says is a Ford Fairmont, two-tone, blue or black, pulls up to ask directions from Johnny. From that point, the car whips around, talks to an adult to finish off the directions and supposedly leaves the scene. And that is where the trail goes cold. It picks up just a little bit later when the phone starts ringing off the, ho off the hook at uh, John and Noreen Gosh's home because people in the neighborhood in West Des Moines, a quiet suburb just west of downtown, are wondering where their Sunday paper is. So John picks up his shoes, gets the dog, heads out, and just five blocks away finds a radio flyer wagon filled with the newspapers and Johnny Gosh nowhere to be seen. And that was the beginning. Natisha Lance, take us back out to that street corner where that wagon was and that 12-year-old boy. How far away was it from Johnny Gosh's home? Well, it was just five blocks away, according to police. And there were two brothers who were there who witnessed Johnny speaking to this man in the car. Johnny then came back and spoke to the adult carrier who was also there to deliver papers. And the car came back around and also spoke to this adult, asking for those directions again. Now, when these two brothers had walked away, they came back 10 minutes later. Johnny wasn't there, but the wagon was still there. Now, another thing, there was a neighbor who was inside their house that morning. They were in the bed. And they say that they heard a loud muffler from a car, allegedly from the same car, the two-tone car that was just previously described. He looked out the window. He saw a man in the car, but there was no Johnny who was inside that car. Police do not know if this car was connected to the disappearance of Johnny, but it is one of the things that has been going along with this case as suspicious.
You know, everybody, this is an amazing case. It's Johnny Gosh. It's from 1982. A little paper boy, 12 years old, went out every morning to deliver papers, but this morning he never came home. You're not going to believe some of the things that have happened since 1982, allegedly, in this case. I want to go back to Natisha Lance. In the late 90s, Noreen Gosh, who has been so critical to this investigation and so devoted to finding her son, says that her son appeared at her doorstep after he was a grown young man. He would have been 27 years old at the time, and this would have been March of 1997. She, at this point, she didn't live in the same house that she lived in before when Johnny was a young boy. She now lived in an apartment, but she says at about 2.30 in the morning, two men came to the door, she let the men in, and she immediately recognized one of those men to be her son, Johnny. She says that she asked him to let her see a birthmark that she knew that he had on his chest. They talked for about an hour and a half, and he told her about his past, what he had experienced over the last couple years. And she says that he said that he had been involved in a child sex pornography ring and that he had to get out of the city. He said that there were people who wanted him to be dead and that he, she offered to call the police at that point. He told her not to call the police because there were possible dangers that would be lurking if police got a hold of what was going on. All right, now we have spoken with police. Police say that they cannot verify this happened, but they also can't say that it didn't happen. Joining us tonight is a man that has devoted many years to this case. It is James Rothstein. He is the private investigator for Noreen Gosh, joining us from St. Martin, Minnesota. Mr. Rothstein, thank you so much for joining us. Now, this, this story that Noreen has in regard to her son appearing on her doorstep in the late 1990s, she actually testified in court to that in a case that was not related to this case, but she testified under penalty of perjury that her son appeared on that doorstep so many years later. Did you meet with someone in Chicago that actually allegedly arranged this meeting? No, I did not meet with him in Chicago. I spoke to the individual who told me that he was brought in out of retirement to go to Chicago and meet with people to arrange and set the rules for Johnny Gosh to go home and in, uh, meet his mother. And when did you have this conversation in relation to when Johnny Gosh allegedly appeared on her doorstep? This happened about six years ago, about 2004, 2005. Do you believe that her son actually found her but told her she couldn't report it? Yes, that would not be out of the ordinary at all. Uh, over the years when I was a detective in New York, uh, there were many situations where people would never, ever uh, divulge what had happened and uh, they would never go home. And when they did, uh, it was not to stay permanently. Now, this is just the first of many sightings, allegedly, of Johnny Gosh. Mr. Rustin, I want to ask you, what do you believe happened to him, if he is alive? somewhere in this country what do you think actually happened to him was he sold into the sex trade industry normally what happens and during the time that i investigated this uh, i personally was involved in many of these types of cases what normally happens is there's a customer for a certain type of kid and somebody goes and grabs them and they usually get paid uh, it can vary from 2500 on up and then it's to deliver to the customer. So in this particular case, I believe that there was a customer looking for a young newspaper boy. That was probably his fetish. That's why there were a couple other uh, newspaper boys that were also involved, one in the area there and one somewhere else. So uh, normally that's how it works. Those that survive uh, uh, and don't get killed right away Many of them survive and become part of the system, and they go underground. We had many cases of children in New York, young men. Uh, they ranged all the way up, and then eventually they also became users of children. So this is not out of the ordinary at all. To Mark Class, president of Class Kids Foundation, joining us from San Francisco. How prevalent is something like this, being sold into this type of an industry, but yet surviving these many years? 
We have learned in recent years the enormity of the sex trade, um, of the human sex trafficking industry in the United States. It is estimated, Gene, that between 200 and 300,000 of our own children on any given year are victims of human sex trafficking. Now, this was an entirely different time, however. Uh, the Internet has provided sex traders and pornographers with a, a much greater ability to reach out and network with each other. So they were much more isolated at that time, probably much more careful and much more behind the scenes. But I would not never discount the theories that have been presented thus far. They sound entirely plausible to me. To C.W. Jensen, retired Portland police captain, what are your thoughts on that if this young man did appear at his mother's doorstep saying, I am alive, here's my birthmark, I want you to see it, but you can't tell anybody because I could be harmed if you do. Uh, to not go to law enforcement with that in, in any capacity uh, until she testified was when it came out, uh, does that have a ring of truth or distruth to you? I, I have to say that, that I disagree with the detective and Mark Class. I mean, this just seems like probably a horrible, horrible tragedy that this young man was killed, was murdered back at the time, and all of these things that have happened over the last 25 years just don't seem to ring true to me. Basically, in the beginning of our case, we were told that we did have no crime and that at that time frame, any child over 10 years old was considered to be a runaway. dawn on the morning of September 5th, 1982. Johnny Gosh had done it plenty of times before. 12-year-old Johnny Gosh prepared his paper route. Loads his papers into the wagon. Johnny set out to deliver the papers for his West Des Moines neighbors. But Johnny never completes the paper route. Sometime during that route, police say Johnny was abducted. Johnny's paper wagon found only two blocks away from his home. Filled with copies of the paper. Police struggled to find leads and solid evidence in the case. There was no sign of Johnny. Decades later, new tips continue to emerge. Since that morning, police have never been able to confirm a credible sighting of Johnny or find viable clues in his disappearance. Johnny's mother insists Johnny was taken for human trafficking and believes he may still be alive. I'm Jean Casares. Everybody says Johnny Gosh was a good kid, that he was so respectful, and he wanted a job at 12 years old to earn money. We do want to tell you, police say that there is no evidence that Johnny Gosh was sold into the sex trade business at all, but they also say they have nothing to disprove that at this point. We are taking your calls live. I want to go to Tiffany in Ohio. Hi, Tiffany. Hi. Thank you for calling, Tiffany. Mm-hmm. Your question. Um, I was wondering, when he showed up at her door with the man, why didn't she do anything to try and help him? All right, to James Rothstein, the private investigator for the mother in this case, Noreen Gosh, why didn't she do anything to help her son in any way, to call 911 or, or get the authorities in some way to reunite him and, and save him from danger? Well, in previous cases that I worked on as a New York City detective, we found that that was very plausible because these people are kept in total fear and are always told that if they talk or do anything, they will be killed, not only them, but their family. We also know that if they have these people more than 72 hours, these children are gone, and they firmly believe that anything they do or say will not only cost them their lives, but the lives of everybody else they were involved with. And I base my information on actual cases I worked on, and at the time we had actually infiltrated the whole underground operating in this, these type of things. So that's what I base my opinion on. Brad Ehrlich, anchor reporter, WHO Radio, joining us from Des Moines, Iowa tonight. Early on in this case, after little Johnny Gosh went missing, there was 
not only a sighting of him 